60 Minutes Rewind. With SARS breaking out in China again, the Chinese have ordered the mass slaughter of animals known to carry the virus. But scientists admit they still don't know where the virus is coming from, what the original source of SARS may be. Every year or so, a new virus seems to spring out of nowhere. Along with SARS, there's been West Nile virus, monkeypox, HIV, and a virus you probably haven't heard of yet, a nasty killer called Nipah. Recently, we went to the Far East with a group of American scientists who were involved in a new kind of detective work. They're virus hunters looking for the next big killer. They're finding that new viruses are leaping from animals into man in surprising ways. And there's no better example of that than the search for the origin of Nipah, a bug so lethal they had to build a prison to hold it. That prison is a sophisticated biocontainment lab in northern Malaysia. The Malaysians never had one of these labs before, but they had to build this one to isolate some of the only live Nipah virus in captivity, collected during the only known outbreak. We went inside with government scientist Dr. Abdul Aziz. The main feature of this uh, laboratory is the, the safety, how, uh, what we call it, uh, complete containment. Meaning, anything that come in cannot go out. Complete containment. Complete containment, 100% containment. Why 100% containment for Nipah virus? Well, consider this. SARS kills about 9% of all those it infects. Nipah kills 40%. So this is live Nipah virus yes, yes, in yes, this yes, dish. Yes. They keep the virus-infected tissue to study Nipah, a virus that's probably been around for millions of years, but apparently never killed a man until recently. The lab is working on ways to identify any future outbreak quickly, because now that they've got it bottled up, they don't ever want to see what they saw in 1997. 97 was the year that out of nowhere, people began to die. 265 people came down with terrible symptoms. Temperature, fever, headaches, but fairly quickly it went into uh, a coma and uh, unconsciousness and then people needing to be uh, on ventilators. Dr. Hume Field is an Australian virus expert who was alarmed by just how fast people were dying. You mean people would get something that looked like the flu and in 48 hours or so they'd be dead? Well, in 48 hours or so they could be in a coma and certainly within a couple more days they could be dead. 105 people were killed on the Malay Peninsula. But fortunately for the virus hunters, it turned out that all of the victims had one thing in common. They were all near pig farms. When Field and the green overalls went to the farms, he found a raging epidemic in the pigs. There would be uh, this, this uh, symptom associated with the disease in pigs, a barking cough, and it became known as a one-mile barking cough because you could hear it a mile away. People would know that the disease had arrived in their area and they'd hear the cough and they'd hear it coming closer and closer into their neighbours and then they'd know that they were going to be next. So within one area, really all of the farms would become infected? Absolutely. The Malaysians pump clouds of poison into the pig farms to kill mosquitoes, a common carrier of viruses, but the disease just kept spreading. So with no idea of where the virus was coming from, Malaysia simply crushed every pig farm in the region and slaughtered all the pigs, more than a million of them. That seemed to do the trick. Two years after Nipah emerged, it disappeared. But the mystery and the danger remain. That's not the end of the story. You don't know how the pigs got it. Absolutely. Uh, and that's the, uh, the fundamental question. Where did, the, where did the virus come from into the pigs? The hunt for the origin of Nipah virus carried us out onto the South China Sea, off the coast of the Malay Peninsula. We're heading to a volcanic island called Palau Tiamen, west of Borneo. It's more than 150 miles from the outbreak on the mainland. Now this island is not very developed, but there are a few small settlements along the coast. However, the interior of the island is just pure primary rainforest. 
Dr. John Epstein and Dr. Peter Daszak are virus hunters traveling the remote corners of the earth for the Consortium for Conservation Medicine. That's a partnership of schools, including Harvard, Tufts, and Johns Hopkins, along with the U.S. Wildlife Health Center and the Wildlife Trust. It's an American program looking for viruses on the far side of the planet. What do you say to somebody who's watching this interview and they're saying to themselves, look, I'm not a pig farmer in Malaysia. <laughs> You know, sure. I, why, why should I worry? We never had monkey pox in America. We don't even have monkeys in America. Okay, how do these diseases pass into a place that seems to be completely unrelated with the increase in global travel, with the increase in trade, with the increase in human activities all over the world? The world's becoming a very small place. So just because there may not be Nipah virus in America right now doesn't mean that a similar virus can't emerge there or that other unknown diseases can't pass from wildlife into people in America. And they're exploring places like this because most new viruses infecting man are coming from the wild. In fact, almost 75% um, of the emerging diseases in humans actually come from animals, wildlife or domestic animals. So normally, you need to go to those wildlife species and look for the virus there. They've come to look at Tiamen Island because they suspect that they will find the animal that first carried Nipah, the original source of the virus. Dazak told us that if this kind of work was done decades ago, it might have changed the history of AIDS. Well, with HIV, we're looking at a virus that emerged from chimpanzees in Africa sometime in the last century. That virus emerged into one single person hunting chimpanzees. It was a single person event. Wouldn't it be amazing to go back there in time and to see that virus actually emerge and say, hey, wait a minute, don't butcher that animal. You're gonna have a virus that then goes on to kill 40 million people. And that's what you're hoping to prevent. Exactly that. We're looking for really the next HIV, the next SARS. Their search for the origin of Nipah is based on a hunch. Nipah is similar to a virus found in giant Australian bats. There's a similar bat called a flying fox here on Tiamen, and Epstein is here to catch them to see if they have the virus. When you step onto an island like this, how do you go about finding bats? Well, you have to look for a certain key thing. One, oftentimes you can hear them from a distance. So you listen carefully for the sounds of the colony. How big are the colonies? Well, it really depends on the species and the geography. In Australia, the colonies can get upwards of tens of thousands of animals. The ones we're seeing here on the island are considerably smaller. The one that we found here so far is about six to 800 animals, maybe a thousand. We didn't find one on this hike, but down the coast, near the beach, there they were, flying foxes, sleeping, shrouded in their three-foot wings. They hang out all day and fly only at night to hunt for food, tropical fruit like mangoes. They return at daybreak. Epstein planned to catch them by throwing up a detour on their commute. He raised an almost invisible black mesh, strung up like a too tall volleyball net. Here we go, ready? Here we go. Bring it down. Come on. Careful. Ready? Where is it? Here, yeah. get the net up, please. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, where's the other one? Well, this one's pretty tangled. Bagging bats turned out to be the easy part. The hardest part is uncatching them. It is. Yeah. They do get tangled up, but none of them get hurt in this netting process. We've not had any injuries in the netting process. We've not lost any bats at any time. So it's a Never? very safe procedure. Never. Safe for the bat, but there's nothing the flying fox would have liked more than to take a bite out of Epstein. Not yet, not yet. All right, net up, okay, lift. Up. Once he's caught 10 or so, he waits for sunrise and does it all again. What do you have? So this is a young male island flying fox. He's probably about a year old. Um, he's in very good condition. And you can see, you know, they're called flying foxes because their heads really do look like a little fox with wings. I want you to take a look at this wing here. Dr. Sohiati, if you could just extend that wing. Now, the wing is actually the entire hand. You can see the arm here, and then the bony structure through the wing are the fingers. This is incredibly thin. It's a very thin, almost leathery membrane that uh, extends throughout the whole wing, down to their legs, as you can see, and it's, it's what they use for flight. Epstein anesthetizes the bat. He takes tiny pieces of the wing and some blood, and then he swabs around those needle-like teeth. And what does the swab in the mouth tell you? 
One of the places that we believe that we actually know Nipah virus um, is present is in the saliva. We found it on a piece of fruit that was being eaten by a bat. We actually found real virus. They found real Nipah virus in a piece of fruit that had been chewed up by a flying fox. And that piece of fruit may well be the missing link in the mystery of how a bat virus came to kill more than 100 people. 150 miles away from Tiamen, this is where the first infections happened. Notice the fruit trees over the pig pens. What obviously happened here was fruit bats were feeding in these trees and somehow dropping bits of fruit into the pig pens, the pigs would eat them and then get infected. That's what we think happened here. The bats don't seem to carry enough virus to infect people, but the pigs became virus incubators, amplifying the virus billions of times and then coughing and sneezing on the farmers. Nipah has probably been around for millions of years, so why didn't this happen before? Because the bats are on the move today, chased out of their natural habitat by man. Because of forest fires? Yeah, forest fires and deforestation, slash and burn agriculture. And uh, fruit bats were seen here for the first time in many years. And obviously if you're a fruit bat, you, you see a very healthy mango tree, you'll just come down and start feeding. Careful. There he is. On Tiamen, Epstein netted 72 bats in all. Of those, four tested positive for Nipah exposure. That's a little over 5%. They found the source and the path of the pathogen from a tiny number of bats to pigs to man. When we talk about wildlife diseases that jump into humans, it's a universal story. It doesn't just happen in Malaysia with Nipah virus. It happens in China, it happens in North America. And by understanding some of the ecological factors that drive disease emergence, some of the factors like human activities that bring people closer to wildlife, that place stress on wildlife, that make, make it more likely for these diseases to jump into humans. And we hope to be able to apply these principles in general to other diseases and prevent future outbreaks. The story will continue after this. I can see that they haven't got any fruit trees right next to And with a little knowledge, the, the virus industry. hunters I'm say the solution industry. can be simple. Malaysian farmers are simply warned not to plant mangoes next to pigs anymore. The Nipah outbreak ended in 1999, but since then, SARS has come to Asia and Canada. And in the U.S., people have been infected for the first time by monkeypox from Africa. Peter Daszak says that other viruses still undiscovered are waiting as man presses into the last wild places on Earth. What worries me the most is that we're going to miss the next emerging disease, that we're going to suddenly find a SARS virus that moves from one part of the planet to another, wiping out people as it moves along. Something more lethal than SARS is what worries you. Like Nipah virus, something with 40% of the people get infected die. That's something to be keeping you awake at night.